Hello and welcome. It is our great pleasure to welcome you all to the Yale School of the Environment's first ever Oceans and Climate Conference. We are very excited to be here today and to learn with all of you. My name is Krista Shenham and I'm one of the co-chairs of this conference. I am a second year Master of Environmental Management student at the Yale School of the Environment. Joining me today is my co-chair, Julia. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Julia Swetman. I'm a first year Master of Environmental Management student at the Yale School of the Environment. We are thrilled to be joined today by speakers and attendees from across the United States, including Connecticut, California, Florida, Alaska, Hawaii, Vermont, and North Carolina. We also welcome people joining us from India, the Marshall Islands, Canada, Germany, Brazil, and many other countries across the globe. Julie and I are both joining you from New Haven, Connecticut. As students of the Yale School of the Environment, we want to acknowledge that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohican, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pagasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. Today, we will hear from speakers in academia, local governments, and civil society to explore together the links, trade offs, and tensions that operate at the nexus of climate change, oceans, and coastal ecosystems. We hope that this conference will allow you to build the knowledge and skills that you need to address the climate crisis and to support vulnerable coastal communities and ecosystems. This conference is particularly relevant now. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have roughly 10 years to limit catastrophic climate change. This century, the global ocean is projected to transition to unprecedented conditions with increased temperatures and acidification, oxygen decline, and altered net primary production. Marine heat waves and extreme El Nino and La Nina events are projected to become more frequent. Around the globe, sea levels are also rising and will continue to rise beyond this century, threatening coastal communities and ecosystems. In light of these current and future impacts of climate change, we decided to organize the Oceans and Climate Conference. This conference creates a space for students and practitioners to deepen their understanding of the current issues and solutions in this field. Today, we will explore a range of subjects focusing on the varied impacts of climate change on natural marine environments and coastal communities, emerging natural carbon solutions, and adaptation practices and challenges. Uh, we will begin with a keynote talk from Dr. Scott Doney, and then we will break off into two panel sessions. The first concurrent panel session will include a panel on plastics and petrochemicals, as well as a panel on coastal and marine impacts and solutions. The second concurrent panel session will include a panel on marine natural carbon solutions, as well as a panel on societal adaptation, planning, and resilience. Uh, one of the benefits of gathering in this virtual space today is that we are able to uh, record all of our concurrent panel sessions, and we will let you know when we have posted the recordings on our conference website where you registered, so you will be able to watch any of these sessions that you may have missed live and want to revisit later. Uh, finally, we will close the conference with a keynote talk from Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, who is a poet, climate activist, and educator from the Marshall Islands. We would like to officially kick off the conference with a brief word of thanks to the Yale School of the Environment for their tremendous support for this virtual conference, and to all the panel co-chairs and volunteers on our conference leadership team. Specifically, we would like to recognize Mia Rabak, Annalise Simmer, Marissa Grenon, Tiffany Mayville, Jonathan Lee and Julian Macron for their invaluable contributions to this conference. And finally, thank you to all of you for joining us today. We are so glad that you're able to join us virtually. We would now like to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Scott Doney. Uh, Dr. Doney joins us from the University of Virginia, where he is the Joe D. and Helen J. Kington Professor in Environmental Change. Dr. Doney's expertise spans oceanography, climate science, and biogeochemistry, focusing on how to apply numerical models and data analysis methods to global scale questions. Uh, his research explores how the global carbon cycle and ocean ecology respond to natural and human-driven climate change. Uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Doney throughout his presentation, please post them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, 
and we will do our best to answer as many of your questions as possible after his presentation. Um, Dr. Doni, it's a real pleasure to have you with us here today, and I will now pass it over to you. Thanks, Julia, and thanks, Krista, for, uh, for organizing this conference. Um, just to check, so you guys can see my screen. Okay, the slides are fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, as Julie said, I'm a professor at the University of Virginia. Um, I've spent some time up in New England. I spent about 15 years in, in Woods Hole. So I'm pretty familiar with uh, the local environment there, but I've also lived other parts of the country and the world. And what I wanted to do was give a sort of a broad introduction talk about uh, ocean and climate and how climate is evolving over time and what the impacts are for marine ecosystems, but also for uh, the people who depend upon the ocean for their livelihoods, uh, for their cultural, their cultural ties. So many of you have probably seen, you know, climate change is increasingly in the news. Uh, we're, we're, we continue to break records. Uh, 2020 is on track to either be the warmest year on record uh, since we started historical data collection or come in second. And this summer we saw a, a massive heat wave across the East Coast. Uh, right now the West Coast and, and, the, and the Rocky region are experiencing extensive drought um, and a, a devastating wildfire season. Uh, similarly, as climate change is affecting the land, it's also affecting the ocean. And one of the ways that, that those ocean changes feed back and, and affect us on land is through tropical storms. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, what's been going on in the research side for how tropical storms such as hurricanes are getting stronger under climate change conditions and how that then leads to dangerous conditions along coastlines, not just in the US, but around the world. Many of you have probably seen something like this figure. This is a an estimate of the temperature record going back uh, through the instrumental period, so, so through the middle of the 1800s. And the gray lines here are the, the year to year variations, the estimates, the best estimates of the, the global mean temperature. The blue lines are the sort of running mean of, of those estimates that have been blended together. Um, and then the, the uh, yellow and orange line are estimates of, or sorry, the blue line is also a model estimate. The yellow and orange line are uh, best estimates of decomposing uh, the anthropogenic contribution. And what you see from the, this gold band here sorry is that the anthropogenic- Sorry to interrupt, Scott. Uh, sorry just to interrupt you, Scott, but your, your uh, slides are not changing. I think you need oh. to enter presentation mode. I am in presentation mode. So let me- There we go. Now I see what the you slide. Uh, I'm seeing your slide okay. with the Holocene temperature range. Okay, we'll just do, we'll just do it this way then. Yeah, okay, Okay. great, um, continue. My, yeah, my apologies, constantly, every AV platform is a, is a challenge. Um, okay, so let me just back up for a second. So um, as I said, the, the, this is a, the plot here is an estimate of the global mean surface temperature. And so the gray bars show the year-to-year -year variations. And uh, to give you some sense in a geologic framework, the pink band is the, uh, the best estimate over the Holocene. So this is the last 10,000 years or so, the time period of the development of human civilization, domestic, domestication of plants, uh, rise of organized uh, large-scale civilizations and cities. And what you've seen over the last 150 years or so is a rapid increase in temperature. And we're now starting to poke above that Holocene range. So temperature has increased by uh, roughly one degree Celsius over a period of about a hundred years. Um, and we're now starting to experience temperatures that haven't been seen on the planet, uh, at least within the time, the last 10,000 years or so the time of the development of, of, of modern civilizations. The gold um, band here is an estimate of the human contribution. And if I go to the next slide, um, if you take the observed warming here in black, 
and compare it to the best estimate of anthropogenic forcing. So these would be everything that humans are doing that is both warming the planet and cooling the planet. Uh, the human contribution completely covers all the observed warming. We don't need to depend upon, for example, uh, natural variations in solar radiation. Those tend to be small on long time scales. They're cyclic, they tend to cancel out. The internal variability of the planet also tends to cancel out. And what we're left with is a human dominated signal over sort of decadal and, and century time scales leading to this large scale warming. The human effect is a combination of warming from greenhouse gases. So these are things like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and also cooling primarily from aerosols. So sulfate aerosols, um, for example, that come from burning coal that releases sulfur into the atmosphere, uh, that produces small particles that uh, backscatter sunlight to space and act as a cooling agent. The warming dominates over the cooling um, and the net effect is, is this large scale warming. So I mentioned the greenhouse gases, the largest single greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. We have very good records of this from instrumental data going back to the late 1950s. This is the so-called Keeling curve that Dave Keeling started uh, at the top of Mauna Loa uh, in Hawaii in the late 1950s. Uh, these records have now been, are now being collected around the world. And what you see is a, a long-term increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide that right now is primarily driven by fossil fuel combustion. So when we burn coal or natural gas or oil, uh, either in an electrical power plant or in a vehicle um, or in a home, the, those hydrocarbon-based fuels get converted to carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere and it stays there for a long period of time. In, in fact, I like to, I do an exercise uh, when I teach about the carbon cycle um, where I give students data on what are the natural sinks and only about half of the carbon dioxide that we're emitting to the atmosphere is removed quickly by these natural sinks. And even if you were to shut off all emissions, human emissions now, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is still gonna be elevated above the sort of pre-industrial background for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. It takes a long time to soak up all of that excess carbon dioxide. Over here on the right-hand side, I'm showing um, the surface temperature record, but now broken down into land temperatures and ocean temperatures. So the blue is the sea surface temperature, the red is land temperature, and you see a lot of the warming that has occurred has actually been on land, particularly a lot of the recent warming, but there is a substantial upward trend in sea surface temperature as well. And if you look geographically, this is just um, uh, last year's anomaly relative to, uh, uh, relative to a section of the 20th century. You see that warming is concentrated, for example, in the continental interiors and over the Arctic and parts of the, of the, of the Antarctic. The ocean surface temperatures tend to be warming more slowly. And in part that reflects that uh, heat that's added to the ocean gets mixed downward fairly rapidly. So you're spreading that heat over a much uh, larger volume of material than you are on the land surface. We talk a lot about temperature change, uh, either on land or the ocean, uh, but climate change is actually a multifaceted uh, phenomenon. So for example, on land, in addition to seeing uh, rising temperatures, we're seeing retreat of glaciers and now some of the larger ice sheets in Greenland and parts of West Antarctica. We're seeing reduced snow cover and shorter periods of snow cover, um, which has uh, substantial effects on water supply. Uh, many parts of the world uh, even out their seasonal water supply depending upon uh, snow melt uh, late in the year. So if you have a shorter snow cover period that can have a lot of uh, impacts on the water cycle. All this extra water from the melting glaciers ends up in the ocean. 
and that's leading to sea level rise. Uh, the sea level rise is also increasing because as you warm the ocean, uh, it actually expands. So uh, like most, most fluids, if you warm it, the ocean expands. It's not a huge expansion, but when you have four kilometers of ocean, even a small amount of heating over the upper kilometer or two leads to a substantial amount of sea level rise. The warmer sea surface temperatures are, I already mentioned. That's leading to sea ice loss, particularly at high latitudes in the Arctic, and also evaporation of more water vapor uh, that is accelerating the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, leading to uh, increased flooding events uh, in many locations. But um, perhaps counterintuitively, because of the way the atmosphere responds to climate, we're also seeing increased drought in many regions. So places that tend to be drought prone are actually getting drier, and places that tend to uh, be wetter are, are often getting wetter. So the water cycle is accelerating, but it's not evenly spread out over the planet. The other thing we're seeing is an increase in weather extremes. So if you think of uh, any weather or climate phenomenon as sort of having a typical bell curve where you have, for example, maybe a few cold days and a few warm days, if that distribution gets shifted to warmer conditions, you're going to lose out on, you're not gonna see as many of these cold extreme events, but what you are gonna see is what used to be a relatively rare warm period is now gonna be much more common. And you're gonna to start to see record hot weather conditions. And we're seeing that in the uh, weather station data around the world, many, many more uh, uh, warm temperature events, uh, warm uh, heat waves, and that's both on land and the ocean. And I'll show a little bit of data on some of these marine heat waves. And I said these extremes also extend to droughts, wildfires, floods, crop failures, and disease outbreaks. So what's the future gonna look like? Well, a lot of, of that is in our hands. So if you remember, if you go back to this slide where I talked about the human forcings, greenhouse gases are the predominant warming factor the way that humans are affecting the climate. And so if we think about the future, we really need to know what human emissions are of these important greenhouse gases. Um, I'm gonna focus here on carbon dioxide, but you could similarly talk about methane or, or nitrous oxide or some of the other greenhouse gases. Um, the way climate scientists often look at the problem is since it's very hard to predict the behavior of people, because you've got political factors, technological factors, social factors. Um, we've developed working with, with, with social scientists, a set of scenarios. These are just storylines that allow us to bound the problem. So for example, if we continue to increase emissions at a very high rate, this red line here, um, you would get very high atmospheric carbon dioxide levels and very high rapid sea surface temperature change. The black line here is the historical and for context. So if we followed this path over the century, you'd see a tripling or quadrupling of the amount of warming we've already seen. Alternatively, if we were to turn the problem around and start rapidly decreasing emissions, you could see a, a rapid drop in, in perhaps even negative emissions up uh, technologically driven or biologically driven uh, uptake of carbon by the end of the uh, century. And so that would stabilize atmospheric CO2 and stabilize warming. But note that even with that stabilization, there does tend to be uh, a little bit of additional warming from when you cut off the, when you stop the emissions. And that's because the climate system has a lot of inertia in it. You can think of it as a flywheel We've spent the last 150, 200 years spinning up the flywheel. Now we need to start slowing it down. So one of the big aspects of this flywheel is uh, all the excess heat that we've added to the system from these greenhouse gases. And it turns out we probably, should, instead of calling it global warming, we should call it ocean warming because more than 90% of the excess heat has ended up in the ocean. 
So even though the sea surface temperatures haven't changed as rapidly as the land temperatures, that's because you've added all this extra heat, but it gets stored at depth. So we can now using ships and these new autonomous robots, um, we can now track the uh, increase in heat with time in the ocean. So this is from a few days ago, there were roughly 4,000 of these floats. Uh, it's an international consortium of ocean scientists and, and um, folks from the climate and weather communities maintain these floats. They give us a really good estimate of how ocean heat content is changing. So what you see is that ocean heat content has been going up and it's actually been accelerating. And if even if we, for example, this pink, or the, sorry, this, um, yeah, I guess pink, we'll go with pink, a line here, even if this was the scenario where we stopped emissions very abruptly, the ocean heat content continues going up because the climate's still adjusting to these elevated CO2 levels. And this is important because remember, if you heat the ocean, you're actually expanding the water. And so this is directly linked into um, large scale, global scale sea level rise. So there's two factors on the global scale. One is this ocean heat content and the other, which we are learning more about, but is a little more difficult to predict is the melting of ice on land. So this is not floating ice, not sea ice, but is actually ice, for example, in the Greenland ice sheet, mountain glaciers uh, and parts of Antarctica. Those are melting more rapidly. And it, uh, the combination of that and ocean heat content is leading to sea level rise. So this is, for example, a tidegate gate record going back to the 1930s from Sewell's Point, Virginia, showing a fairly rapid rise. Um, it's gone up about four millimeters per year. That compares to global rates of about one to one and a half millimeters per year. One of the really intriguing aspects of sea level is that you have global sea level, the whole ocean is going up with time, but how people perceive it depends on what's happening to the local land where their coastal infrastructure, their homes, their ports are. So the East Coast of the United States and parts of the Gulf of Mexico are particularly susceptible to sea level rise because in addition to this global increase, there are local climate factors uh, along the mid-Atlantic that are leading to uh, more rapid increases in local ocean heights. Uh, and the land is also sinking in some of these locations. So you get the combination of the land going down and the ocean going up and you see a faster relative sea level. Uh, that sinking or subsidence is particularly acute in parts of the Gulf region um, where we're seeing uh, rapid subsidence of the land surface. So what does this mean for people? Well, some of this doesn't need to be catastrophic. It doesn't need to be a big storm. It's simply that um, as sea level rises, uh, tides become uh, elevated. So the normal variations of the tides, right now we've been seeing king tides because of the sort of annual cycle of where we are relative to the moon and the sun and you get what's called clear sky flooding. And that's very common along the East Coast, particularly down where I live in, well, in coastal Virginia. And this is uh, strongly affecting many communities. You see streets are cut off, homes are flooded, uh, infrastructure is cut off. Uh, for example, the Port of Virginia or parts of the large Navy base facility in Norfolk are often cut off because of these clear sky flooding. And that clear sky flooding, which now is mostly, you know, sometimes it's called nuisance flooding, is going to become more and more uh, prevalent with time as sea levels continue to rise. The other aspect of flooding uh, and sea, linked to sea level rise has to do with storms. So, for example, this little diagram here shows if you have a tropical storm that's spinning counterclockwise. Um, the, right-hand side or the eastern side of the storm tends to pile water up onto the shore. This is called storm surge. Um, and it can be lead to very large flooding events. If anyone's been following the hurricane season this year, uh, 
the highest recording storm surge uh, along the Louisiana coast was 17 feet above mean sea level. And this is a very flat region. So you can imagine if you have 10, 15, uh, sometimes even 20 feet of storm surge, how devastating that can be to communities. That's coupled with intense rainfall events. So this is from Hurricane Isabel um, uh, in, the, in the early 2000s that dumped a tremendous amount of rain in North Carolina and through up through central Virginia and into the Shenandoah Valley. And so for many coastal communities, uh, flooding is the flooding, not wind damage, is the major threat from these storms. And you get flooding both from sea, uh, storm surge coming from in from the ocean, but also inland flooding coming down, and they both meet at the coast. And to give you a sense of the effect of sea level rise, this is just showing for New York a variety of different storms. And this dark blue band is the effect of sea level rise. Effectively, what you're doing is you're making individual storms stronger. Even if the storm is, has the same storm surge, if sea level rise is getting bigger, that makes the, the effective damage of the storm surge larger. Unfortunately, storms aren't staying the same strength. They're also increasing with time. So uh, the right, or sorry, the left-hand panel here, everything in red is showing places where because of ocean warming, and changes in atmospheric circulation, you'd expect uh, storms to form with greater intensity. And one way to think about this is tropical storms are actually the energy to drive those storms is ocean heat content, so ocean warmth. So they're tropical storms, they form and survive in places where you have a lot of warmth that can be transferred from the ocean into the atmosphere. And so as you warm the ocean, you're actually strengthening those storms. And that's what we're seeing over time is a, a more and more of the storms that form are actually in the stronger categories. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily just need to be wind speed. Some of the most devastating storms are much larger. So they have a much larger footprint when they hit coastlines. And um, there's some indication that they're moving slower. So the effects of the flooding, because there's the, hang around on the coast longer uh, is uh, intensified. So from the US perspective, uh, we primarily get tropical storms. Um, we do get tropical storms hitting Hawaii and some of the Pacific Island, uh, uh, Pacific Island US territories. We get storms through the Gulf of Mexico, Florida, Carolinas, but even all the way up into New England, you have the possibility of strong tropical storms. Um, right now we're on storm Epsilon. So it's the, we're, we're approaching another record breaking hurricane season. The amount of damage these storms do is intense. This is just showing there have been 48 tropical storms in the last 40 years that um, their damages have exceeded a billion dollars and that's uh, inflation adjusted. So it's, it's um, a fair comparison. And tropical storms, um, when you compare them to all the other weather and climate events together, uh, tropical storms generate about uh, over half the economic damage and a little less than half the fatalities. So from a national and regional perspective, these tropical storms can be quite damaging. So I'm gonna transition here into looking at marine heat waves. So the same factors that, excess ocean heat that's leading to these stronger storms is also affecting marine ecosystems. Everything from coral reefs and coral, coral reef bleaching to die-offs in, in fish, marine, marine birds, um, uh, and impacts on marine mammals. So this is a, a recent estimate of, uh, on, and this is on a log scale where you see um, an increase in the intensity and the duration of these marine heat waves. And this is showing where a lot of these marine heat waves are occurring. A lot of them in the Eastern Pacific, out into the Central Pacific. Uh, but interesting, there are marine heat waves that are hitting in the Western North Atlantic and coming down into the Gulf of Maine and along the New England coastline. And this is another example of as we shift the distribution, 
we're going to see more and more of these extreme heat waves simply because the uh, overall mean conditions are warmer. It's more likely that your extreme events will fall out here in these record breaking conditions. Um, excess heat has all sorts of biological impacts. One of them is that it allows uh, many disease vectors in the ocean to spread, um, uh, to spread to regions where it used to be too cold for them to survive. So this is, for example, showing uh, a couple of different uh, marine microbe, um, uh, uh, marine microbes, diseases that affect uh, oysters. We're also seeing an increase in the intensity uh, and frequency of harmful algal blooms. Uh, and this is often linked to places where you have excess nutrient pollution. So the oceans are getting warmer, we're adding more nutrients, that combination is really conducive to these harmful algal blooms that affect recreation, swimming, fishing, shell fishing. So it, it affects tourism, jobs, human health, uh, and be, can be quite devastating. And I should add that these harmful algal blooms are not just a marine phenomenon. Uh, we're seeing them in some of the Great Lakes. So for example, Lake Erie uh, is seeing uh, quite a number of these harmful algal blooms. Another factor associated with warming is that many species have adapted over long periods of time to a particular um, thermal habitat. They, they don't want it too cold, they don't like, want it too, too warm. And what we're seeing, particularly for many commercial fish where we have very good data, is that, for example, as the US Northeast shelf region warms with time, we're seeing these species disappear in the southern end of their range. This is, for example, red hake that used to be very common off of southern New England and down into the mid-Atlantic, and now appearing in cold, what used to be colder uh, regions, such as the Gulf of Maine. And this is being seen um, pretty much everywhere where we have uh, long-term commercial stock estimates, where we have geographic information. So off of Western Europe, off Japan, uh, uh, in the, uh, the wet, or Eastern Pacific as well off of US and Canada. Now, this has effects on fishing communities because many fishing communities are adapted to a particular uh, species. Um, there has been some uh, really good work by um, Malin Pensky's group down at Rutgers looking at how fishing communities are adapting to these climate effects. So for example, they looked at large vessels um, coming out of Beaufort, North Carolina and Portland, Maine. The Beaufort, North Carolina, the larger vessels were adapting by traveling much further. They're still trying to focus on the same fish species, um, but they're having to steam much further away from local waters in order to catch those fish species. Uh, in Portland, um, they're not seeing the same effect in part because uh, the Gulf of Maine supports a very diverse fishery. So the fishing community is able to switch from one species to another. And they're also, um, uh, interestingly, in, in the Gulf of Maine, because of the geography, some of the species are actually, instead of moving poleward, they can't because of Nova Scotia, they're actually moving to deeper waters. So the, um, the fishing community is moving offshore, but doesn't have as far to go. Smaller vessels don't have the same opportunities. Um, and so some of the biggest effects we're seeing are on communities with relatively small vessels uh, that are focused on a specific uh, fishery that is now disappearing. And we need to work to help those communities adapt by either switching to other species that are now moving into their region or away from commercial fishing. On a larger scale, at least based on models, we expect a warmer ocean to become more stratified. Uh, the surface ocean is going to warm faster than the, the deep ocean below. And so the mixing that tends to bring up nutrients that supports a lot of biology is going to slow down. So we'll see a reduction in surface nutrients over much of the ocean. And in the tropics and say parts of the Atlantic, we, at least based on the models, we think that that may lead to reduction in the 
amount of photosynthesis by marine plankton at the bottom of the ecosystem. But at high latitudes, because of the warming, uh, organisms tend to grow faster under warm conditions. And also because of the um, reduction in deep mixing and the retreat of sea ice, you may actually see increased productivity both uh, at both in both the Arctic and around uh, the Southern Ocean. So the effects on the ecosystem is gonna vary regionally depending upon the current conditions and how that's gonna be affected. If we wanna think about the overall ecosystem, you know, the, the phytoplankton are down, are down here. Uh, they feed a variety of smaller zooplankton creatures that then feed up to fish and squid. And some of these are being commercially harvested or eaten by seabirds or marine mammals, protected species. And so to get a really good handle on any particular species, you need to understand the feedback mechanisms between, for example, what happens if you increase um, phyto phytoplankton at the base or increase fishing pressure, how does that filter through the ecosystem? So it can often be uh, complex and somewhat counterintuitive for any particular species. There are groups who've been trying to do um, large scale projections for climate or for, of climate change impacts on commercial fish catch. All the places seen here in blue uh, and into the stronger blue are places where at least the models are suggesting that um, the potential commercial fish catch is gonna go down with time because of climate warming and because of these rain shifts where some of the commercial fish are gonna be moving out of uh, regions that are too warm for them. Uh, to give you a sense of the dependence upon fish for seafood, uh, some of the biggest impacts are going to be in the tropical regions where you have very large changes and drops in fish catch in regions shown here in land in these, in these orangish reddish colors, countries where the populations are particularly dependent upon seafood as a major protein source uh, in their diet. I can't remember if it was Julia or Krista in the introduction mentioned ocean acidification, which is a topic that's, that I work on a lot. Um, without going too much into the chemical details, um, roughly about a quarter of human emissions of carbon dioxide are currently taken up into the ocean. That carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid. And so over time, uh, the, as the amount of carbon dioxide in the ocean is going up, this is from a time series, uh, an excellent time series near Bermuda, the water is becoming more acidic, so the pH is going down, and the uh, chemical state is, is, in, is such that it's harder for organisms to make shells out of calcium carbonate. Uh, one of the key components they need is carbonate ion, and this excess acidity actually acts to reduce the amount of carbonate ion in seawater. That makes it harder for corals, many shellfish, some crustaceans to grow their shells. And that's just shown here. Um, on the right-hand side is an example of, of uh, growing a, a bivalve under, um, uh, under elevated CO2. Um, the shell tends to grow smaller. It doesn't grow as quickly. It's thinner, uh, it, high enough CO2 levels, the shell's actually malformed. And there's been considerable work across a whole range of different organism types where many of the organisms that form shells or skeletons out of calcium carbonate, um, for example, corals, some types of plankton, mollusks, shellfish, um, they all tend to do more poorly um, in terms of growth and calcification. Some organisms actually tend to do better and there's a whole host of different uh, biological impacts that we're just starting to understand. And then the last uh, major topic I just wanted to touch on because it was uh, brought up uh, in the introduction is oxygen loss. And so the ocean is experiencing oxygen loss for two reasons. Along coastal regions, the points marked here in, in red, we're seeing um, oxygen loss because we're putting too many excess nutrients. So these are nutrients that are coming off the land, uh, nutrients that were originally put down, for example, as fertilizer on agricultural land, 
uh, runoff brings them, they get into streams or into groundwater and they're making it into coastal waters and into estuaries. There are also some nutrients that are uh, traveling to the coastal ocean via the atmosphere, either from fertilizers or from fossil fuel use. Uh, this is often called nutrient eutrophication because it leads to large phytoplankton blooms. And when those blooms die, they're consumed by bacteria and that takes up oxygen. So a lot of estuarine waters, a lot of coastal lagoons have much lower oxygen levels than are healthy for, than for the species that used to reside there. In the open ocean, we're seeing oxygen loss um, and that's shown over here on the, on the right. Um, and this oxygen loss is driven primarily by a combination of warming and changes in ocean circulation. So remember I said the ocean was getting more stratified. So you have warmer water over cold water, the surface is getting hotter faster and you have less mixing. So fewer nutrients are coming up to support primary production and less oxygen is penetrating into the ocean interior. There's a whole variety of other things I wasn't able to cover. There are some really excellent uh, IPCC reports and other reports out there. I just wanted to show this as a, as a quick summary. Uh, these are, these color bars are showing as you go from white to yellow to red, it gets, and then into the purple, more and more likelihood that you're gonna pass some set of eco, uh, ecosystem or biological threshold. So for example, for warm water corals, we're now up here, we're, we're actually even more uh, warmer. Um, we're in a region where we're already passing a threshold for warm water corals. It's too warm for them. The coral bleaching, massive mortality uh, events are happening uh, around the world. And the further we go in terms of warming, uh, the greater likelihood that uh, coral systems will collapse. For some other systems, for example, seagrasses, we haven't really reached that threshold yet. We are seeing some heat wave events and die-offs, but they're not as frequent or as common. But if we continue on the trajectory we're going, we'll uh, likely see that uh, much more frequently. And then similarly down here for uh, different types of ecosystem services. I do wanna end on, uh, uh, and this is my last slide, I do wanna end on a somewhat upbeat note. Um, Remember I said that people are the cause, you know, primary cause of climate change, right? The warming that we've seen is almost entirely human driven over the last century and a half. The future depends critically on what our future emissions are of greenhouse gases. And there's considerable political will around the nation, around the world into reducing those emissions. And there are already technologies and approaches available to do that. And so if we didn't do anything, we'd stay on this, this sort of golden business as usual curve, emissions would continue to go up. Uh, but what we're already seeing is efforts to move this curve down to this red curve, which would be a, a trajectory that would eventually reach uh, net zero emissions uh, towards the end of the 21st century and would allow us to hopefully stay below that two degrees Celsius threshold that I'm, that I'm showing here, this threshold up here where you'd see extensive damage for, to many ecosystems and many ecosystem services. And the way we're gonna do that is through um, switching away from fossil fuels to renewables, using increased energy efficiency in buildings and transportation, and perhaps even uh, start to uh, uh, utilize uh, carbon removal technologies, whether that's replanting forests or restoring wetlands that, and, uh, that store a lot of blue carbon in our coastal communities, our coastal environments. So I think there's a lot of uh, potential for uh, or opportunities to reduce future damage by changing our behavior as a society right now. So I will stop there and let me see if I can pull up the question and answers. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna read through these or Chris, Chris or Julia, did you wanna? You yeah, want I just... think we can, I, we have a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, yeah. I can just read them out to you if you that would, would like be that great. to be easier. Yeah. 
Sure. Um, so our first question is, from a scientific perspective, what actions would have the largest impact at mitigating the effects of climate change on the oceans? And that sort of builds off your last slide, I think. Scientifically, what would be the, the most? I mean, so, so I think there's, so, so this is one of those ones. Scientifically, the case is so clear that climate change is happening. So then it's a question of how do we apply, how do I apply my tools either as a, as a, a natural scientist or as a social scientist to help develop mitigation options and help develop adaptation options. And, you know, the climate change world is, is, a, little, is a little quirky. Mitigation here would be, for example, um, developing um, in the green, um, expanding the use of solar energy, for example. Um, so if I were an oceanographer, you know, are there technologies like wave energy or uh, offshore wind power um, that could be enhanced? Um, and I would need to know, for example, you know, Virginia is putting out a lot of wind power. We want to make sure it doesn't have other negative environmental impacts. So understanding its effect on marine organisms through sound, through pollution, dredging, things like that. Um, we're doing a lot of work on these carbon re removal technologies that are at their infancy right now. Uh, we're, we just ha had a National Academy meeting yesterday uh, trying to look at what some of the technologies are and science can really help figure out which technologies are effective, which have uh, are potentially have low cost, uh, which have low environmental impacts. So that's one of the, I don't know if I put that slide in. I didn't. Um, the one of the real concerns is that you know you can develop a new approach, but it can have other problems that you didn't anticipate. And then I think there's a lot of things that can be done on the social science side. You know, a lot of these technologies aren't going to be implemented if they're too expensive, or if there aren't policy mechanisms to implement them, or if the public perception. You know, if they haven't been framed and communicated in a way um, where people accept them and give uh, social li license to implement these technologies. Great. Uh, we have another question from Kevin Doyle. Um, has the marine science community had to design new data gathering and ecosystem methods and technologies to perform qualities climate science? And can you provide some examples? Oh yeah. So, um, so, and Julie, can you guys still see my screen? Yes, we can still see your screen. So just to give you a sense, um, when, when I started in oceanography, um, the way we made measurements was you got a bunch of oceanographers and you went out on a ship and a, a research ship moves about the speed of a 10 speed bicycle. And so to go from, uh, you know, I did some of my thesis work, um, takes about two months to go from Iceland down to the equator making measurements. You have to, you know, you drive for a little bit, you stop, you lower an instrument package, pick it up, drive, stop. Um, very expensive, very slow. And so we laid down, when I was a student, a baseline and we didn't expect somebody to come along for five or 10 years to be able to remeasure that baseline. Um, in the 30, 40 years since then, the development of these robotic floats and other, all sorts of other robotic instruments, these are actually profiling Argo floats. So they float around at the mid depth in the ocean. Every week or so, they, they profile the uh, much, most of the upper, uh, two kilometers of the ocean. They radio their data back to, uh, via satellites, back to uh, researchers on land. And we're getting a weekly snapshot from these 4,000 floats. That's a, you know, that's a huge number of, of ships, places that we don't normally go. Um, and this is just an example. There are, you know, coastal systems for measuring um, uh, much more high frequency, high resolution data. Uh, these uh, Argo floats started off as just being physical measurements, temperature and salinity. 
they're now measuring uh, pH for ocean acidification. They're measuring oxygen to look at biology. They're measuring nutrients. And so the robotic, inf the robotic information era, and then you combine that with much better satellite data and much better uh, tools using new data analysis techniques. And we're really at a, at a point of a revolution. Um, uh, many oceanographers now don't go to sea and they don't even live by the ocean because the data comes to them. So that's a great, maybe a longer um, answer than you wanted. No, that was great. Uh, so we, uh, just a reminder for everyone, if you have questions for Dr. Doni, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, so you can enter your questions there. Um, our next question is, how do you see ocean warming changing the thermohaline circulation? Do you see a future where it may slash will stop? Um, and I don't have any slides in my deck for that, but that's a really great question. So one of the concerns is, um, in the North Atlantic, you have a large volume of surface water that's flowing up into the Norwegian, Greenland, Labrador seas. Along the way, it gets cooled um, and it eventually sinks into the deep ocean. And so you have, it's sometimes called the conveyor belt circulation where you have warm surface water moving northward. It gets made more dense because it's cooled, it sinks and then it returns at depth. <clears throat> that has lots of consequences for the deep ocean because that brings, for example, a lot of oxygen into the deep North Atlantic. And it also has a lot of weather and climate because as those warm waters are moving towards the pole, they're actually, this is one of the reasons why Western Europe is so warm is because you have all of this warm, uh, all this heat that's being brought into the region by this current. There's an excellent project being done by a combination of US and uh, United Kingdom researchers that have been documenting the rate at which this cell is, is circulating. So the warm water going northward, cold water moving pole or moving southward. And it looks like it's slowing down. It probably, at least based on the models, we don't think it's gonna stop. But I, my best sense is that from the, the papers I've been reading, is that we can now say definitively that it is slowing down. It's most likely due to uh, ocean heating. Um, and uh, the long-term consequences of that, I think we're still working out, but it's, it's probably, you know, it's just another one of those signs of things that we don't want to see. You know, we wouldn't want to see it collapse or even decline greatly because it's such an integral part of the, the planetary system. Great. Um, our next question is from Jenna, and she asks, what is the potential for reversal of coral die-offs if eelgrass beds are restored in proximity to corals that are, are, that are threatened? Yeah, so, so one of the, um, I think one of the really interesting ideas out there as a, um, and, and I would call this an adaptation strategy, is, um, Ocean acidification is because you're, you're, you're adding carbon dioxide. And so could you locally uh, add something that removes carbon dioxide? Well, what's, what are things that are good at removing carbon dioxide? Well, plants, they photosynthesize, right? So, so the, you know, uh, and this has been suggested for um, uh, eelgrass next to coral and also for aquaculture having seagrass beds near um, aquaculture farms and having them work together. Um, particularly interesting is, you know, if you're, you know, growing, you could be growing, for example, macroalgae that you're harvesting for a profit that would also make things more uh, habitable for your mollusks that you're growing with aquaculture and that you'd get multiple benefits, co-benefits from that. Um, those are primarily in the pilot stages and they're going to, you know, in the end, they're always going to be small scale because the, the size of the, you know, the, the size of the problem, for example, for the Great Barrier Reef, you know, we're just not going to be able to technologically keep seawater chemistry at the right levels for the entire Great Barrier Reef. Uh, there is some indication, you know, warming is a stress on corals, acidification is a stress on the corals. In some cases, it looks like the combination 
it's, it's one of those one plus one equals three. So if you have one stress and you have another stress, if you add them both together, it's much worse than, than in them individually, or even if you just sort of added, added them together. So anything we can do to um, reduce the stress on coral reef ecosystems will be a benefit. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, what is the ideal form of collaboration between physical scientists and social scientists on climate change solutions? So the physical scientist writes a bunch of equations on the board. No, just kidding. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of the reasons I moved down here to Virginia, and, I, and I, I love Woods Hole and I love New England, but one of the opportunities was to be at a university where we have a lot of, of uh, excellent diverse social scientists, whether they're economists or political scientists, or um, you know, we have a lot of people in urban planning. Um, it takes a long time to develop trust between those communities. You have to develop a shared vocabulary you know, I, and I, you guys, you know, I, I was going to call you the School of Forestry, sorry. Um, School of the Environment, you know, you, you guys are somewhat unique in that you have natural and social scientists having coffee with each other every day. And that's not true uh, in a lot of places. And so a lot of times it's just, it, it takes time to develop those relationships so that you can mutually work forward, you know, find problems that you both can contribute to uh, that you can actually talk about. Um, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate that I've been able to, to find some colleagues and, and hopefully we'll eventually do some good work. But um, it's, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, Yale, Nicholas School, Bryn are some of the few places where um, we're actually training the next generation from the, bringing these multiple aspects together and not just treating them as a set of siloed disciplines. Thank you. Um, I think this will be our last question. Uh, and the question is, what gives you hope for the future of climate science? Where do you see science advancing most rapidly? Well, I, hope is, I, I, and I, I say this all the time, it's my students. Um, you know, we're training, Yale's training, really, really bright, motivated people who are uh, who who see what the problem is right and i you know let's see if i can bring this back up um you know he, here's sort of the problem you know we need to go we're up here we need to get to here it turns out that a lot of this is not you know we don't need to wait for mit to invent commercial scale nuclear fusion Right, wind power is already, and solar power are already um, de being deployed at scale. Uh, they're often cheaper than alternatives, and so it's figuring out, you know, what are the barriers moving forward? Are they economic barriers? Are they political barriers? Are they social barriers? We 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 don't. I, I'm I'm pretty confident that we don't need some mythical, you know, ring that will will save us, that we have a lot of the technologies in place. Now, if we're getting down here into the blue, some of these negative emission technologies, those still need to be developed and we need to start working on them now. But man, you know, I, I don't know what, I'm sure the Yale has, you know, there are no incandescent light bulbs, you know, you're not burning coal in your basement and the windows aren't single pane. Those are all things that we've done over the last, you know, few decades. There's lots of further energy efficiency uh, and fairly straightforward um, abatement technologies that we can put into place. It's you know the end of the century. We're, right now, we need to be working now on the R&D side for what we want to deploy 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. So I'm optimistic. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Doni, for sharing with us today and for such an insightful and informative presentation.